Good morning and welcome to worship on this absolutely picture-perfect early summer day here, Memorial Day weekend. I'm so glad you've come to start your week and uh, celebrate uh, Trinity Sunday together. It's also Trinity Sunday. At the end of the church year, we go through from Advent to Christmas and Epiphany and Lent and Easter and Pentecost and then to crown it all as Trinity Sunday at the end of that cycle. And so we'll sing to our triune God today in worship. I want to thank uh, Ken Godshall and the elders for leading worship last Sunday. Uh, I listened to it online and it was a terrific sermon and a great service. Thank you all for leading worship and covering while I was gone. And it's, it was great to be away and to be in Chicago. I'll tell you a little bit about it in the message today, uh, the conference and then some time with our daughter. So it was wonderful to be away, but it's always great to come home. And that's kind of our theme today is coming home. So we are home in worship together. At the sound of the bells, please stand and join in the call to worship. Let us praise God, the Creator. Let us worship God, the Savior. Let us experience God, the Spirit. Let us worship the Triune God. Please remain standing for our prayer of confession at time in our service as we pause to recognize before Almighty God that we are indeed sinners in need of grace. Let us pray first our unison prayer followed by a moment of silent and personal prayer. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we confess that we are an impatient and selfish people. When you offer us the promise of a new future, we complain that we don't get there fast enough when you provide for our needs, we complain that it isn't enough. Holy God, forgive our sinful ways. Teach us to be patient. Instruct us to be grateful. Guide us to be responsible and humble. May we turn around and look to the cross. Let us experience your grace and your gift of new life. In the name of Christ our Savior, we pray. Amen. Friends, we have good news to share with one another on this beautiful Sunday morning. That famous verse from John 3.16 tells us that for God so loved the world that God gave us the only Son that whosoever believes in him may not perish but have everlasting life. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. We are indeed forgiven. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. Thank you. Let us pray together and we'll conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Gracious God, we gather on this beautiful day to worship you. On this Trinity Sunday, we worship you as our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. 
You are worthy of our praise, and we are grateful to be your people. On this day of remembrance, we honor those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice in service to our country. While we are grateful for our freedoms, we humbly acknowledge we are too quick to take up arms against our enemies. Help us to work tirelessly for the day when we will turn swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. On this day of worship and praise, we are especially grateful for our home, our church family, where we can share each other's joys and bear one another's burdens. We pray for those who are in need of healing in body and spirit. We think of those for who are now celebrating the good things in life. We pray for those dealing with a sense of loss in their family and circle of loved ones. We pray for those dealing with extreme weather throughout our country, even loss of life in several communities. Help us to be a nation where neighbor helps neighbor. We pray all these things in the name of the one who taught us to love you and to love our neighbor, the Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'll go ahead and read our first scripture reading this morning, as uh, we don't have a reader for it today. But uh, it's a beautiful reading from Isaiah. I was pleased, as you'll hear in the sermon, that it is our lectionary reading for this day, an important reading on worship. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our music today is around the theme of Trinity Sunday and, and around home, familiar songs and hymns. And uh, the opening hymn, Holy, Holy, great majestic hymn to God Almighty, to middle, the middle hymn and this anthem around Jesus, our, our sweet Savior, and the closing hymn around the Holy Spirit on this Trinity Sunday. I was also pleased when I looked in the lectionary for this week, and it is John 3, 1 through 17. Another very familiar passage, uh, with especially that famous verse we all know, John three sixteen. But in its context, Jesus is talking to a young man named Nicodemus. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. 
What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that, who, that whoever believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's good to be home. It felt good to be home, come home last Monday after a week in Chicago. It felt good to sleep in my own bed, to see the church staff and get back into my routines. And it really feels good to be with all of you here in worship. This week reminded me of what a special place we have here and how our church is home for us in many ways. It is our house of worship where we gather with friends and like-minded people. It is comfortable. It is beautiful. It is home. It's always good to go away because it makes you appreciate home more, right? But don't get me wrong, it was a really good week and I'm glad I went. The conference had some good speakers and preachers and of course it was great to spend a few days with our pregnant daughter, Debbie. This week made me think a lot about home and what makes a place a home. Our daughter is moving to a new and larger apartment, so she will soon be turning that place into a home for her, Olivia, and their baby. And the conference made me realize that I was outside my comfort zone somewhat because I was not at home, at least not my church home. See, the conference was sponsored by Clamp Divinity School of Anderson University, a Southern Baptist school in South Carolina. Now, I knew it would be a stretch for me to be in that environment, and I was looking forward to being stretched. It was certainly entertaining, as many of the preachers were from black Baptist churches, and they really know how to preach. It's a style that's rooted in their culture, and it probably wouldn't work for me, but it was fascinating to watch and learn. There's a lot of repetition on major points. One preacher wanted to drive home the point that the words of Jesus in the gospel were for you, no matter who you are or where you are in life. So he said, whether you are a man or a woman, Jesus is talking to you. Whether you're rich or poor, Jesus is talking to you. Whether you are young or old, Jesus is talking to you. After about a dozen of those, you got the point. Jesus is talking to me. So I sat up to listen. I was also fascinated with the use of rhyme. So I wonder if rap doesn't have its roots in the black church. One preacher was making the point that we are all broken and in need of the presence of the Holy Spirit with the clever rhyming phrase, we're all broken and busted, poor and disgusted. Broken and busted, poor and disgusted. So we all need the Holy Spirit to make us whole. I enjoyed the preaching, and there was lots of it, but I must confess, I didn't get much out of what they called worship. In our tradition, the whole service is worship from the prelude to the postlude and everything in between. But in their tradition, what they call worship is simply the singing of the worship songs. They'll say, let's stop and have some worship now. 
And so a band with keyboard, drums, and guitar, along with two singers at microphones, would lead us in songs that were unfamiliar to me. Years ago, I knew some of the songs from that tradition, but I didn't know any of these. They put words on the screen, and after the many repetitions, <laughs> I started to get the tune in my head. Some people were really moved by the worship experience, swaying with hands in the air, but I was not feeling it. That is until one day they started singing one verse of How Great Thou Art. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder. For a moment, at least, I felt at home. When I got home, I was excited to see what scripture lessons the lectionary had assigned for us this Sunday. One of the Old Testament readings was Isaiah 6 and that great vision of Isaiah in the temple. And the gospel, of course, was from John 3, including the familiar John 3.16, what some have called the gospel in a nutshell. It felt like a homecoming to plan worship with Eric this week and to be with all of you. Our hymns have been familiar, and the scriptures explain why we worship the way we do. Years ago, I heard a sermon that showed how Isaiah 6 provides a template for what we call Reformed worship. It's not to say this is the only or even best way to worship, as I tried to make clear with the kids, but it is our way. It is what we are comfortable with, and there is some solid theology to underscore our order of worship. Isaiah 6 opens with Isaiah having a vision of the Lord, sitting on a throne high and lofty, and it says the hem of his robe filled the temple in this vision. This opening line describes why our houses of worship attempt to create some sense of beauty, sacredness, and even awe. Our church sanctuaries try to move the worshiper into another space set apart from everyday tasks and routines. I love this sanctuary, and I know you do too, the light coming through the windows, the light blue walls that bring to mind the heavens that declare the glory of God, the cross and the organ in the front of the church that tell us we are in for some great music to lift our spirits in praise, beginning with the prelude and ending with the postlude. Then the next verse in Isaiah says that there were seraphs these mystical creatures with six wings who call to one another that it is time to begin worship. And that is what we do each Sunday. After the prelude, we call one another to worship. The seraphs then begin to sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And you and I sang, Holy, holy, holy today to echo their words. And every Sunday, our opening hymn is one of praise singing of God's greatness and glory. Then Isaiah realizes something important. He is in the presence of Almighty God, and he is reminded that he is merely mortal. He does not deserve to be in God's presence. He admits he is a sinner, a man of unclean lips, he says. And so you and I stop to acknowledge our sinfulness before God each time we gather for worship. The goal is not to make us feel terrible about ourselves. The goal is to get us ready to receive grace. And that is what happens next. One of the seraphs takes a coal from the altar and touches Isaiah's lips in an act of cleansing and forgiveness with the words, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then and only then, Isaiah is ready to hear the voice of the Lord. And then you and I are now ready to hear the word of God read and proclaimed. The message of the voice of the Lord that day was, Whom shall I send? And Isaiah responded with, Here I am, send me. And so after you and I hear the word, we respond with our offering of tithes and offerings and ourselves. Finally, God told Isaiah to go and tell the people, God's message of hope. And as you and I end our worship hour, we are told to go in what we call a charge and given a blessing. We are told to go and be doers as well as hearers of the word. So now you know why we worship the way we do. 
We can vary that format once in a while, as we, like we will in a couple of weeks at, uh, when we worship at Gedney Park. But this is worship for us. This is home for us. It brings us into God's presence with reverence, ready to sing God's praise, receive God's grace, and to hear God's word. It is my comfort zone. I feel like I have come home even when I go to a Reformed church worship service anywhere else in the country or, frankly, around the world. Even in England last summer, I felt at home as that little church in Warwickshire that I told you about followed this same basic order of worship. Summer is now upon us, and for many, that means some vacation and travel away from home. So while you are away, I encourage you to attend worship somewhere on Sunday mornings, if possible. If you're on a cruise, they often have a chaplain and hold an ecumenical worship service. So I'm told. I've never been on a cruise, but I've heard. And if you are on a cruise, they uh, have a chaplain that you will hold a service. If you are camping, there's often a Sunday morning outdoor service. If you're visiting family, perhaps they have a home church that you could attend with them. I encourage you for three reasons. First, it is just good to stay in the pattern of beginning your week with worship on Sunday morning. Second, you may gain some insight or perspective from a worship outside your comfort zone. And finally, I want you to have the experience that I have had this week of looking forward to coming home to our church. We have something special here. It's not perfect or the only way to worship, but it is our way and it feels like home. Now, all this talk about comfort is not to suggest worship cannot make us uncomfortable at times. In fact, it probably should. Worship should both comfort and challenge us. Worship can comfort a troubled soul, but it can call us to action as well. Someone coined the phrase that the gospel should comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. We should not expect comfort all the time and in all all ways. Our church is like our family. It is where we are encouraged to become the best version of ourselves with the help of God and others. And at times, that calls for some stretching and some discomfort. I close with a story about an experience of coming home. When I was to give what is called the candidate sermon for the pastor nominating committee from this church, arrangements were made for me to preach at the First Presbyterian Church of Austin. The lectionary gospel for the day was John 3, 1 through 17, the same passage that we read today. And so in that sermon, I explained how Jesus was trying to explain to Nicodemus what it means to be born again. Nicodemus is confused He says, how can I go back into my mother's womb and to be born again? And Jesus shook his head and began to teach Nicodemus about a different kind of birth, one of the Spirit. As you read these words of Jesus, you begin to get lost in the argument about the Son of Man ascending into and descending from heaven, and Moses is even brought into the story, and then it happens. Those familiar words just leap off the page. For God so loved the world that God gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him may not perish, but have everlasting life. That verse may need some explaining too, but it doesn't matter. It's so familiar. It's comforting to hear every time. I was making that point in my sermon in Ossining, and I shared an analogy. I told of sitting through a classical music concert, as I often do because of my son's profession, (laughs) And I must admit, sometimes my mind waters and I may even get a little bored. Don't tell them. And then it happens. A familiar melody emerges from the music and I get drawn back in. And perhaps the best example for me is the New World Symphony by Dvorak. The beautiful second movement begins with the oboe playing the melody of what we now know as the spiritual hymn, Going Home. I wrapped up my sermon that day, and the talented organist at First Presbyterian Church began the offertory with the opening chords of that Dvorak movement. I was stunned, impressed, and most of all, I felt at home. Little did I know that we would be planning worship together (laughs) a decade later. 
As you hear that beautiful melody in a moment, let it take you home. If you need comfort, let it comfort you. If you need to be challenged, may it challenge you. Most of all, may it give you a new appreciation for worship and its ability to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. For God so loved the world that God came to be with us in our home so we could someday sing going home. Amen. Well, it's good to be home, isn't it? And now as we go from this place, take that message of God's love with you wherever you go and invite people into our home throughout the summer, wherever you may be, and uh, we'll look forward to each and every Sunday being together in this place. Come and have some refreshment and then get ready for rummage. Two weeks today, we'll be worshiping down at Gedney Park. So summer is here, folks. Let's enjoy, but let's be in worship whenever we can throughout these summer months. Now receive this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you and all God's people said, Amen. <laughs>